Yes, we will get started. Um, can anyone not hear me? Okay. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I know it's the last session. Um, I'll try and get through this fairly quickly. Uh, so I, I, I'm coming here today to talk about, uh, well, actually, I'm supposed to introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, James Morris. I work on uh, the kernel, uh, in, and I work mainly in the security area of the kernel. I've also worked on the SE Linux project, NetFilter, and a few others. And I currently work for Red Hat based in uh, Sydney. Uh, so I thought I'd come to talk about uh, sandboxing uh, in SE Linux, or using SE Linux and sandboxing together, um, and the way that this is implemented currently in Fedora. And uh, there's a number of reasons for this. One is that uh, sandboxing is a is a sort of a, a, an emerging topic at the moment. There's uh, quite a bit of interest around this area, so I thought I'd uh, explain what what we're doing in Fedora with that. Uh, it also helps to explain uh, and illustrate some um, ideas in security, uh, some concepts that are, are being applied that uh, we can now do now that we have a lot of the pieces in place in the operating system. And also, uh, I'll do a bit of an architectural kind of deep dive into how it works and, and pull it apart so that people can see uh, which components uh, that are being used and how they might be reused uh, for their own purposes or just to get a better understanding. And also, something that I think is important is that uh, with computer security, we have uh, quite a complicated uh, problem to solve with you know the, the the full software stack starting with the operating system and the hardware and at every level we have uh, fundamental issues that are fairly complicated and probably the main tool that we have to deal with in in addressing security is abstraction so just like as with programming you have programming languages you have higher and higher level abstractions to the point where you have people um, end users programming macros into their uh, spreadsheets and so on. Uh, you, you build abstractions to, to hide complexity and to, to simplify. So sandboxing actually represents one form of uh, abstraction in security to demonstrate this. So I'll just give a, uh, a brief, very brief overview of sandboxing, uh, how uh, this is uh, implemented in Fedora 12, um, and some examples of how you would use it, and then start talking about where we want to uh, take this. Check the music. Okay, so sandboxing can refer to all kinds of uh, concepts. Uh, the general um, idea is that you want to isolate usually one application from the rest of the system. And the analogy is the sandbox that a child plays in in the, in the playground where they, they can you know, build uh, dams and, and, and do digging and various things. And they stay in that little sandbox. They don't actually uh, destroy anything in the real world. Uh, so similarly, you want to uh, run an application which you may not trust or you may not be comfortable with for some reason. Uh, so sandboxing is uh, often conceived as a way of uh, confining that application as you run it. And uh, it's a form of isolation. And there's other types of uh, sandboxing, for example, virtual machines, such as Java is uh, potentially considered a uh, type of sandbox. Uh, and so in this case, what we're talking about is a sandbox which is implemented at the process level. Um, and so that's where we're limiting our scope to here. So there's, there's a number of existing sandboxes available in uh, Linux. Uh, some examples such as, uh, that exist include uh, Chiroot, and uh, we have the seccomp um, processing mode where a, an application is limited to, uh, I think, three system calls. Uh, you can use ptrace, which is uh, a form of um, constraining an application at the as a kind of syscall wrapper. Uh, all of these have um, various issues uh, and various advantages. Uh, there are some new designs which have come along um, in hacking the box in Malaysia. Uh, I think the, they're from Google. Uh, the, some Google security folk came up with a new design that they want to use for uh, Chromium, uh, the operating system. And it's called the SetUID sandbox. And again, that's another type of process-based sandbox. Uh, which um, is like a cheroot on steroids that randomizes user IDs so that each sandbox runs as a, as a separate uh, user ID. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed with a lot of these sandboxes is that they don't utilize uh, existing, they don't necessarily utilize all of the security or security relevant facilities in the operating system, such as mandatory access control, which is where the SE Linux uh, angle on this comes from. 
Um, and also, most of them are based on a model where you have um, try to restrict what's uh, sometimes referred to as ambient authority. Uh, and this is basically when you have a program that doesn't have any restrictions. Um, and by default, for example, an, an application um, actually, I'll, I think I get onto that in a couple of slides. But the idea is that uh, these things are actually trying to contain um, applications which have general purpose permissions. So um, it's a you know, fundamentally difficult issue to work to, to try and address. So uh, with uh, mandatory access control, and I'll be using Mac to refer to mandatory access control, not the uh, networking Mac, uh, the idea is that the, um, Mac security doesn't bring anything uh, particularly special or amazing to sandboxing. It's just another uh, aspect that you can integrate to make better sandboxes. Uh, so it's, it's um, you know, we have like a layered approach uh, and if you can consider um, the concept of defense in depth. So when we're, we're thinking about sandboxing in Fedora, we try and use all of the facilities that we have. Uh, so you have uh, the, the memory management unit and the hardware provides a certain amount of um, protection between processes. Uh, we also have um, discretionary access control based um, separation, such as uh, being able to have different user IDs. The set your ID sandbox uh, from the Google guys uh, uses this uh, randomized um, UID to help separate further. Uh, in um, the SC Linux sandboxing, we actually had something similar, but instead of randomizing the user ID, we actually randomized the security labels to make sure they're all separate. Um, and also, uh, Linux has a, name, a good namespacing uh, facilities now, or useful namespacing facilities, where you can uh, launch a process with its own um, file system namespace or its own network namespace. So we're utilizing that. And then we get, what we're doing with uh, SE Linux, uh, mandatory access control, is to write a policy, security policy, which is basically uh, really about isolating the sandboxed process from the rest of the system, so even further. Uh, so one of the uh, really interesting uh, security ideas that's been um, getting some attention recently is uh, around um, reducing something called uh, ambient authority, uh, which I mentioned a bit before. And there's a whole area of research. Uh, people who are uh, uh, following the security research are probably familiar with things like uh, object capability models. And um, a really simple way to explain this is to consider the example that I've listed here where you have um, the WC utility in Linux or Unix uh, word count and what it does, you uh, use it to open a file and it will tell you how many uh, words, lines and characters uh, exist in it. So typically uh, if you just run that on a file, WC needs um, general read permissions on the operating system to be able to open any file because you don't know ahead of time uh, which, uh, which files you'll be um, counting and analyzing. Um, so when you actually run WC on a file, uh, it has all of this what's called, or you're actually using something called ambient authority to, um, to allow that to happen. It just has a, has a um, whole set of uh, permissions which are there whether you need them or not. They basically exist in, in the environment um, regardless of what your security needs are. So it changes a bit if you um, change the command line and you cap the file and pipe it to WC. Um, and this is uh, a very important aspect of uh, Unix and uh, from, has a really interesting security property in that um, what happens is that your shell will actually open the WC application um, and then use a file descriptor, pass a file descriptor to it and pass the information uh, it'll, so you will actually open up the file and then pass the file descriptor um, read or with open for read or write to WC. So now the application doesn't actually need any um, general purpose permissions to do anything. You could actually write a security policy which says that um, this application now longer now no longer needs any permissions except to read and write on a file descriptor, maybe load some shared libraries. And what you're doing is you're bundling the authority with the uh, object that it's accessing. And we are kind of, it's a, and so there's a whole area of research into this and there's some uh, desktop um, projects which uh, implement this idea more generally. I think Plash is, is one, of the, one of the examples. Um, people may be familiar with that. 
Um, and so the advantage here is simplicity, right? We now no longer need a complicated uh, security policy for this application. We're actually telling it when we uh, pass it the file descriptor what it can access at the same time as invoking it. And under, as I was mentioning, under Linux or, or Unix in general, because of the design of the operating system, we're kind of limited in being able to apply this idea, but the file descriptor passing and the processing pipeline is actually uh, a really good model for, for simplifying security. So as you can imagine, what we're doing here with um, SC Linux is to actually provide a really tight, um, isolated policy to run applications in using this um, abstraction of passing file descriptors. So from a usability point of view, uh, we can basically write a general purpose sandboxing policy which is really tight and isolates uh, any sandbox application which we invoke as a sandbox uh, to only being able to have the absolute minimum uh, amount of permissions that are required to basically uh, receive a file descriptor and read and write on it. Uh, there's a couple of other things that you need to do like um, load shared libraries but we could actually reduce that um, to, you know, to have uh, static... Um, binaries if you really wanted, but we also have labels on the shared libraries, so we, we know where the shared libraries are, uh, and we know that we're limited, we can limit the application to only actually access uh, shared libraries. So one of the features of this is that there's no configuration, and there's a security, uh, sorry, there's a, a, a launcher application, it's just called Sandbox, and when you run an application, you just type Sandbox in the name of the, the program, and it um, the sandbox launcher actually sets up all the security and invokes the sandboxing uh, mechanism, which I'll dive down to into the architecture of a bit more um, after this. So we've actually had some uh, similar abstractions that we've used uh, previously with SE Linux that have been uh, fairly successful. One is kiosk mode. Uh, you have um, the ability to have a constrained or a confined user who logs in as a guest and uh, you can't, can't really do anything except browse the web and all of the state disappears. And also SVIRT, which I uh, presented last year in um, Tasmania at this conference. Uh, it does something similar for virtualization. It um, basically sandboxes or isolates the virtual machines when you're running process-based virtualization. Okay, so these are some uh, details on the uh, SE Linux implementation. I'm not sure how to remove the text from this slide, but probably if I did, it would probably end up looking like a photo of a cat with bacon taped to it or something. Uh, but basically, as I mentioned, the idea is that uh, there's no general system permissions for the sandbox. Um, and when you launch a program, it actually applies the policy to the program you launch, so you actually don't need, even need to know ahead of time which applications are sandboxed, you as the user determine by launching it as the uh, sandbox, you actually don't need any privilege um, to, to do the launching either. Um, so this sandbox uh, program, it's actually a Perl script, so if you're running Fedora 12 at the moment, you can uh, just go and look at the, the source code of this on your system. Um, and all of the I.O. happens over a file descriptor. We also assign a unique um, security label to that particular invocation of the sandbox um, where you, it's called uh, an MCS label or multi-category security. This is actually a, a sort of simplified version of MLS. That's a very similar acronym. So we're actually adapting uh, military um, security labeling for use in you know, general purpose. So we get basically a dual use uh, out of this and it, uh, that has a number of benefits. We don't have to have separate um, separate builds to be able to address, uh, the, you know, say, uh, government users or, or, or um, non-government users. Um, so this is very... So we an assign these labels, we, we, have, we randomly generate them, and this is very similar to the uh, user ID um, allocation in the set UID sandbox. And we could actually probably implement that as well to provide further uh, DAC protection. And then this script, um, it does a bit of housekeeping, It'll set up um, temporary directories that are, are used and uh, these are created in a private namespace using uh, the tempfs. So then when it exits, all of this is, uh, just disappears. And that's actually quite similar to SVIRT if people uh, remembered. Sorry, um, chaos mode with that. So this, uh, just going to a bit more detail, 
if you go and look at the source code, I've, I've basically just read the source code and uh, explained what happens here, and um, actually just described that. So here's a, a basic uh, use example which will demonstrate uh, the, lab the security labeling aspect of it. So the id command, or I think it's, I don't know if people pronounce it id or id, basically tells you who you are, and if you use a dash capital Z, uh, when you're running SE Linux and uh, several other security systems, it will give you the security labeling information. So normally as an unconfined user, you log in, and um, this is one part of the security label. Uh, you have, um, you can see that it's a, an unconfined type, and on the right side at the top, the C0 and 102, 1023, normally you don't worry about these, these are uh, related to the way that um, the defense and government users classify information. Uh, these are, um, what this is basically saying is that dot mean is a range. So basically you have from C0 to C1023, which is all of the uh, compartments. So on, a, on an MLS uh, government system, uh, those uh, compartments might be code words or, or various things. In a, in a business system, it might be the name of the department. But internally, we actually just map it to a, an integer. Uh, so it's uh, possible to translate those. Um, so when you uh, run the same command under the sandbox, I've changed the colors just so that you can see. Uh, it's running under the sandbox uh, type. And it also now has uh, two numbers there, uh, which are um, MCS labels. And they are basically randomly generated and uniquely, they may, we may also do a check to make sure that they're uniquely assigned on the system. And um, it actually doesn't matter what uh, those numbers are, just as long as that they're distinct for each sandbox. And that gives us the ability in the security policy to use uh, the fact that they're different to isolate the sandboxes from each other. Now, the sandbox label, there's a policy which relates to the sandbox label, which determines how the, uh, anything running with that label, so that ID command, uh, how it uh, actually uh, interacts with the system. And this is where we uh, have, uh, just like a firewall, we have default deny and by default uh, sandbox T basically can't do anything. You, it can't open a file, it can't read a general file, it has, it has a, a very limited uh, ability. So here we have a kind of two aspects. We have the um, isolation from the rest of the system and then we isolate the sandboxes from each other with this uh, MCS label. Okay, so this is, uh, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll try a bit of a demonstration. I don't know if people can read that. So that's, there's actually a bit more labeling information there, uh, which I've, I've just left out. It's not really relevant. And if I run sandbox, um, so you can see now that the security labels have changed. And every time I run it, those numbers should change. If I ran multiple invocations, uh, then um, they, they would um, be different. So I should be able to just, actually, um, I'll do this as root. So this is also a bit of a, a demonstration too of how privileged applications can be um, confined as well. So normally you would expect root to be able to create a1.txt. But if I run through the sandbox launcher, okay, so that permission was actually denied by SE Linux uh, at the mandatory access control level. Um, and that was because the touch command that I was running there was actually running in, in, in that sandbox, uh, with those sandbox labels. And there's no uh, policy which says you're allowed to create a, a new file on the file system, regardless of whether you're root or not root. Of course, most applications are a bit more complicated than this, so. And that was actually, a, this was an example 
which somebody mentioned to me, I think it was David Howells, when I was, I was showing him this a few months back, uh, there was some exploit that was uh, reading the proc and your own ID, uh, user ID maps file to, to look at um, addresses uh, to, to help with an exploit, and that worked. So that, that's, that's the kind of thing that uh, when somebody's, let's say you have a, 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 an application with a vulnerability in it and a, and a hostile, uh, you're processing information which has been you know, crafted uh, to attack, say a, a hostile PDF application, uh, you're limited to even you know, what kind of information you can introspect about the process. Okay, so one of the one of the issues that's often raised or has been raised with this is, well, what uses standard uh, I/O for um, processing? So initially, there there is quite there are quite a few interesting uh, things that we can use, such as um, the processing pipeline for information coming in and out of organisations. So you uh, say for email, you'll you'll process it through a number of stages, and uh, this is one area where you might want to run your antivirus filter and, and various types of um, spam filters and so on inside sandboxed um, invocations because there's often been um, vulnerabilities in, in these uh, applications. Also, uh, things like you know, TCP dump and so on, there's, there's been plenty of uh, vulnerabilities in those. And it, this is the kind of thing, if I'm um, you on, a, on a, actually probably even at home now, I'd probably start considering running some of these things with a sandbox, but certainly if I was at a conference and a particularly a, a security conference, I would, and I was uh, wanting to have a look at a bit of the traffic, I would certainly be be using a sandbox. Um, and also, we have some types of applications process things in pipelines, uh, XSLT rendering of um, HTML coming off application servers, CGI applications passing parameters backwards and forwards, uh, that kind of thing. Basically, anywhere where you have a separate process. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, talk about how we can start applying this to the desktop, which uses obviously a, a more complicated model. And it's quite difficult to, to address uh, desktop security uh, with fine-grained controls, basically, basically because of the complexity of the, uh, the environment. And I don't think anyone's been particularly successful in this area. So it's an area that we'd really like to address. And people who have been following this might have uh, heard about Sandbox X, and it's basically just the... Uh, SE Linux Sandbox with a, a dash, capital X. And what we do is um, apply this sandboxing to the entire X server, and you run launch applications uh, in a nested X server, which happens to communicate over uh, file descriptors. So all of the graphics and X protocol or whatever go over the file descriptor. So when you uh, go to uh, run a, a simple desktop application, uh, if it's simple enough, you can just simply uh, launch it in the uh, with a dash x. Actually, um, I'll give a demo of it rather than drill down too much into it. It's probably a bit more interesting. Okay, so let's say you uh, had a, a, a need to read a PDF file, and you were a bit concerned that your um, PDF reader might have a vulnerability in it, or that uh, you don't trust the person who made the PDF file. It's, some sort of security document that you downloaded somewhere and you think they might have put an Easter egg in there for you or something. Uh, so we can just run uh, sandbox dash x. I'll use events. And there is a... Okay, so what I'm about to do here is basically launch the events um, PDF reader in a sandbox environment and it will actually be launched in its own X server, which is which is all the, the entire thing is is confined. Okay, so this is the file I wasn't too sure about. So we're actually using um, Zephyr, which is a uh, one of the nested X servers, and it lacks the ability to resize the window at the moment, so I can't actually make a smaller window than this. Uh, but as you can see here, I'm inside the application, and then as I move out, you can see the mouse separating that it's actually a separate X server. And this basically works. You know, it's, it's, um, it's functional for relatively simple applications.
So I'll just uh, show you some more process information. Okay, so what, what we can see here is uh, events running. This is actually the events that's running my uh, presentation. And if you look at the security label, it's un basically unconfined everything. S0 to S0 just, and C0, all those are just default um, MCS or MLS categories. But then if you look a bit further down, you can see um, I've run the sandbox application, which has launched a, a series of scripts, and then it's running Zephyr, which is the, uh, the um, nested X server, and run some other scripts that eventually launch you at the application. And you can see over here that uh, we have sandbox X server type, and we have a sandbox X client type. And these are basically policies which are specific to, say, an X server, and then a policy which is specific to a client running inside an X server. So we, we and they're generic enough, uh, and, and because of the, the fact that we're only uh, doing very simple things, they can actually be uh, locked down uh, quite tightly. And then you can see over here, I'm highlighting the, um, the MCS labels, which is just, it's just think of them as two random numbers. Um, and if I run a second invocation, we should see... Uh, this is the second nested X server. And you can see over here you've got MCS you know, 53 and 757 in here. We've got 62 and 628, just uh, two, two randomly generated um, integers from between 0 and 1,023 inclusive. Um, and so though that stops them from interfering with each other because as you can see, they actually have the same SE Linux uh, security label. And they probably have the same, actually, they, they have the same user ID, which is my user ID. So things like a, a user ID randomizer would help increase the protection as well, but this then potentially requires uh, having privilege in the, uh, a privilege launcher to do that. Yeah, so what happens when we run sandbox uh, with the dash x? command is that um, we, uh, this is, a, yeah, actually this is simulating. Okay, so unshare is a system call which uh, allows you to uh, utilize the uh, namespace facilities in the kernel. Uh, so what it does uh, in this case is um, creates the, launches the sandbox process without, with a completely private namespace. And when you do, when you have a private namespace, you have no shared uh, file system access at all, and you then have to explicitly add in uh, or explicitly mount um, shared file systems. So it creates um, a new home directory and a new temporary directory using tempfs, um, which is only visible to that process. And even as root, it's only still, or well, actually as root, you still can't have any visibility. Um, and then it uh, does a shared mount of the, the general file system as well to, to, to access uh, things that it needs there, if, if, but generally speaking, it probably can't uh, do much there, except you know, load shared libraries and so on. Uh, it then sets up the security labeling, uh, drops all the capabilities and calls another script, which is the um, X aspect of it, uh, which configures X. Uh, it launches the nested X server. It's actually running the Matchbox uh, window manager. Um, and also does a bit of cleanup and housekeeping at exit just to make sure nothing's hanging around. And another limitation of this at the moment is we can't copy and paste between them, and that's obviously a bit of a problem. Um, but that, that's being worked on. So the current status of this is that if you go and install Fedora 12, if you have Fedora 12, uh, it, uh, basically it's just there and it works. You don't have to configure anything. You can use some high-level uh, graphical tools from the admin um, menu to create um, new types of sandboxes, and if you want to get into policy writing. I've already done the demo. So we've got some uh, drawbacks here, and as I mentioned, uh, we, this is only for, for fairly relatively simple applications. 
Uh, there's a saying, I think Casey Schaeffler mentioned it last time at the, um, the security mini comp. Uh, isolation is easy, but it's uh, sharing that's difficult. And this is a, a, the case here. Uh, we have to look at, you know, what do we do with a more complicated application like um, Firefox? And some, let's say somebody launches a, a sandboxed Firefox. Uh, do they want their bookmarks? Do they want their, anything that happened? Do they want to save any state? Do they want their cookies uh, kept and that kind of thing? So uh, ultimately, I guess what we would like to have is for this to be built in so the user actually doesn't have to think about it. They might um, create a... There might be support within the application to configure. When I um, access these sites, I want this completely private uh, with no history saved. And so they don't actually realize that there's sandboxing or SE Linux or anything going on. It's just some really simple uh, thing for them to configure in their privacy settings or so on. And then we just go off and do this all behind the scenes. So uh, you might want to, say, do all your internet banking in a completely sandboxed environment where nothing's copied. Uh, or you may want to uh, go on and online, uh, grab a PDF file, read it, and then maybe save it to your, ha your home directory. So we have to figure out how to do this sharing stuff, and that, that's quite difficult. Now, there's also uh, security labeling going on inside X. Uh, it's called the XACE extension. Uh, the, uh, some developers from the US National Security Agency have been working on that. And basically this allows, it's a kind of SE Linux type of system within X, although it's pluggable like LSM, so you can plug in different security models. And this is working reasonably well now, and this allows you to put security labels on Windows and for them to actually mean something, that all of the mediation is going on inside the X um, protocol to stop snooping on Windows. So at the moment, uh, there is sandboxing going on, but if someone was running X spy or something, they may be able to, to get in. So desktop is quite quite difficult, and we will, will need uh, this uh, XACE facility and, and security in the X server as well. And as I mentioned, one of the uh, interesting uses here is to restrict administrative um, privilege. So people might remember that recently there was an issue with Fedora allowing you to install packages without a password. That's Sandboxing may be a, a, a way to allow you to do, carry out very restricted certain uh, forms of um, administration as, a, as an end user um, and, and, and being able to lock down very carefully uh, that, that privilege. Although in that case, I don't think that would be a particularly good use case here. So Dan Walsh did most of the, the, the work on developing this. So basically any resources you need for this um, He's, he's another developer at Red Hat, his blog. Uh, he did a talk on this at Linux Plumbers Conference last year. The URL for this, it's pretty easy to Google, but you can also be able to download it from the LCA website. Uh, the other thing, you can email him. Um, just call him on his cell phone, which I'll conveniently put here. Uh, that's actually, if you Google that number, you should find something interesting. Okay, so are there any questions? Ah, the microphone's coming. Um, at the beginning, you said that these sandboxes, uh, sandboxed applications cannot open any files. And then you ran the events uh, PDF reader, and it opened the PDF files. So do you have different profiles? Okay, so the way that worked is um, my shell actually opened the Acrobat file. So it opened it up. It then launched this um, sandboxed um, events and passed a file descriptor, an open file descriptor to it. And it events then just reads on standard in and standard out. So it actually gets all of its um, information over that file descriptor. So that, that's how uh, events read that. So how would that work with uh, Firefox, for instance, that needs to open millions of files? Yeah, so with, with something like Firefox, that's, that's one of the challenges. And I think the supporting that is a bit better at the moment. But uh, we actually also have some command line switches that allow you to specify files that you want to copy into the environment and files that you can copy out. So we're looking at profiles and cookies and various things. So we really don't want, the thing is, we really don't want users to get bogged down in these things. We want to have higher level abstractions and, and to make that 
So they actually, we, we really don't want them to notice security. That, that's actually one of the big challenges with security is that uh, if users notice it, you probably, you know, there's probably something wrong um, because generally speaking, they don't like it and they'll, they'll switch it off. Um, so everyone is probably familiar with the SE Linux being disabled, but if you search for any, you know, disable IP tables, disable App Armor, that's, the Google hits come up on these as well. So we, we really want to make that as simple as possible and figure out how, and we, I think, I think there's some good work going on there at the moment. Okay, so the question is, has any of this uh, migrated to CentOS? Uh, not that I know of. This is just new in Fedora 12, and I believe I'm, I work for Red Hat. I'm not authorized to speak about RHEL, but my understanding based on what I read on LWN, which I know probably just as much as anyone about this kind of thing, is that uh, I think CentOS will be based around one of these Fedora releases, so it will, I believe it will be in the next CentOS that comes out, or the next RHEL that comes out. How does this compare to the work that the Google guys have done on Chrome and their SecOp, sandcop, their SecOp sandbox? It's a, the, okay, the SecComp sandbox. Um, okay, so with, with SecComp, uh, the secure computing mode, you actually uh, have very limited uh, system calls. So it's very similar. And in fact, um, we've got some people internally looking at using SecComp as well as all of this. Um, because you, you really don't need these extra system calls, generally speaking, uh, would be a, as an extra layer. So um, their sandboxing um, would be limited by the fact that it only has those uh, system calls and you can't necessarily do as much. Um, yeah, it's a bit hard to say. We, we would probably adapt ideas from that if, if, they, if we thought they were suitable. Um, but I, I haven't actually evaluated that. I mainly looked at the set UID sandbox stuff because that was presented fairly recently. And I don't, actually, the set comp thing, that's, I'm not sure. I think they want to extend set comp to have like arbitrary um, expressions and different, different system calls. I think what you'll find is that gradually that will become as complicated as every other solution if you want it to do basically the same things but it will probably have some uh, race conditions, well, not necessarily have race conditions, but you have to address the issue of uh, race conditions. So when you uh, open a file and you do a check on it, uh, has some other thread come in and changed it then when you go to use it, whereas using the LSM hooks and something like SE Linux, you're actually checking uh, at the point where you're about to use it, and we know that it's a safe place to check. So that there's a um, paper that Robert uh, Watson did from B the BSD project, I think it's called syscall wrapping considered harmful. So there's a whole lot of issues there. It doesn't mean that they can't be solved, but there, there's some complexity there that needs to be addressed. Um, when you're running something in the sandbox and uh, the application violates the rules, where do you see that being reported and, and can you log it? Yep. Okay. So um, there is a re SE Linux reporting tool, and it will fairly annoyingly pop up messages to you on the system. Um, you can see them here, actually. So you can configure the system to to ignore certain uh, ignore these. You can get them to, to send them by email and so on. This is just one way. Is to um, by default, it, it uses this thing called uh, SE Alert, which is actually based on the GNOME Bug Buddy, which when they were developing GNOME, they had this thing that would pop up and help you submit bug reports. I've been doing a bit of testing here. It's interesting to actually have a look at what um, the Adobe Reader does when you launch it. Yeah, so here's the one. Here's, here's the one where uh, I tried to create a new file in a temporary directory. So with, with a sandbox application, you may want to actually um, ignore it, and you can, I think you can, you can configure that. And this is, a, this is actually quite a small screen, but... 
So here's all the details here. And we have like an, an intrusion detection system which will start detecting these things and, and log analysis and so on. Um, and there you can ignore that one in the future. Uh, you can copy it to the clipboard and uh, email it to Dan Walsh and he'll tell you what it means. Actually, that, that's literally sort of how we do this. You know, on the Fedora SE Linux list, people who are on there, you just if you have something you don't understand, uh, you send it out. And usually Dan or several other people now have figured out how to analyse these things in detail. So it's not, not the most friendly log format, but you can, you can get it. Somebody will be able to figure it out very quickly for you if you, if you can't. So, are there any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for coming. It's the last session of the day. So, On behalf of the LCA organisers, I have some uh, fiasco wine for you. Thanks. And uh, let's show our appreciation for James. Thanks.